Hello, and welcome to Financial Markets Microstructure. This is lecture number four. In the previous class, we discussed the relation between information and prices in the markets. In particular, we discussed what it means for the prices to be efficient, given the information available to market participants. And we have also introduced our first model, which was the gloston milgram model, which explored how asymmetric information in markets can drive the bid-ask spread, or the spread between the bid and ask quotes. We saw, in particular, that um, there is a trade-off between market liquidity and price discovery, and that more informed traders in the market foster better price discovery, but harm market liquidity. We also saw that despite the presence of the bid-ask spread, the prices were in fact efficient in those markets. What we will do today is we will consider two other factors that can uh, generate bid-ask spread. And we will also begin talking about how the effects of these different factors differ. In particular, how we can empirically disentangle all these different factors of bid-ask spread. We will begin by looking at order processing costs. Consider a dealer market. So a market with a central intermediary, a market maker, a dealer. This dealer can have a wide range of different order processing costs, such as, for example, trading fees that the dealer must pay to the exchange for the right to trade at the exchange, for the right to be a dealer. The dealer may also have to pay the clearing and settlement fees whenever they um, execute a transaction. So these are paid if a central clearinghouse is used uh, to clear trades, but in most large exchanges this is incorporated in the exchange fees. And just to clarify, by clearing and settlement I mean that both the dealer and the trader who trades with the dealer get the asset that they pay for and the other side receives the payment in full. So you can uh, see clearing and settlement as the plumbing of the market. The systems which guarantee that money and property rights for the assets flow in the right directions. Finally, the dealers basically need to eat they have some overhead expenses, office rent, um, basic salary. Possibly they also uh, have their own research departments and analysis departments to allow them to be more informed uh, and possibly offer better prices to the traders but also lose less on trades against the traders. Now, this is a wide variety of costs that the dealers incur. And in addition to that, if dealers are not perfectly competitive, they might also receive some extra profits. They may receive some rents on top of these costs. All of these costs and the extra profits come at the expense of the traders who get to trade with the dealer. Therefore, these costs do affect the spread. To see this, let us uh, take the gloston milgram model from the previous lecture and assume now that a dealer incurs cost gamma for every transaction and charges this cost directly to the trader. 
Now first, let us do a brief refresher of what the Gloston Milgram model actually tells us and what the notation was that we used. In particular, we had one asset traded in the market and this asset had some fundamental value V, which was not known to the dealer, which was not known to the uninformed traders, but which was known to the speculators or the informed traders. However, all other part market participants only have some limited information summarized by omega t about the actual realization of fundamental value V. Therefore, the market as a whole agrees on the market valuation for the asset, which we denote as mu t. So mu t is the market valuation at the end of the period t. And it is given by the conditional expectation of the fundamental value V, given all the public information available to the market. Now let SAT and SBT denote the half spreads so that the ask price quoted at in period T is given by the market valuation at the beginning of that period, so mu t minus 1, plus the half spread. And conversely, the bid price is given by the same market valuation at the beginning of period t, so mu t minus 1, minus the uh, bid side half spread, as bt. Now, if the dealer has some transaction cost gamma for every tra uh, for every transaction they they make for every trade that they execute and dealers are perfectly competitive so they must obtain zero profits in equilibrium this cost must be charged directly to the traders meaning that it directly enters ask and bid prices and so the ask price becomes higher by gamma because the dealer must still receive this mu t minus 1 plus SAT, and then the exchange must receive gamma, therefore the trader must pay mu t minus 1 plus SAT to the dealer and gamma to the exchange implicitly. Therefore the full price that the trader must pay for a unit of the asset that they want to buy is given by this new expression for the S quote. Now the same uh, works for the bid price. Whenever a trader wants to sell a unit of the asset to the dealer, then the amount that the dealer is willing to pay for this asset is given by mu t minus 1 minus SBT from the Gloston Milgram model. But from, but on top of that, the dealer must pay uh, the dealer must also pay cost gamma to the exchange and this cost gamma comes from this amount that the dealer is willing to pay in total therefore the amount that the trader receives for their unit of the asset is given by this mu t minus 1 minus sbt minus the transaction cost gamma so you see that the spread is extended by the transaction costs. In particular, if we just compute the spread directly, st, the distance between the two quotes, it will be given by our old spread in the absence of transaction costs plus 2 gamma from the transaction cost. So you see that the spread has two components. or a tr transaction costs and adverse selection costs coming from the Gloucester Milgram model. How can we disentangle the two? How, if we observe a given some, some quotes from the market, how can we figure out which part of the spread in these quotes comes from the order costs and which part comes from adverse selection costs. 
Well, you on if you only observe one pair of quotes, there is no way you can infer that, right? Because you only observe the total spread, you do not know how it splits into the two. However, if you observe the dynamics of quotes over time, then you can make that inference. And the difference between the effects of adverse selection and the order costs lies in their dynamic impact on the prices. In particular, the instantaneous effect of order costs is similar to that of adverse selection costs, as I've just outlined, but the dynamic effect is quite different. So, as before, we let D denote the trade direction, so D equal to 1 will denote a trade in which the trader is willing to buy the asset and the dealer then sells the asset. And D minus 1 is the opposite. Here the trader acts as the seller and the dealer acts as the buyer. Now let S of DT denote the relevant half spread generated by the adverse selection. So it's either SAT or SBT depending on the direction of trade. And then the realized price paid by the trader can be written down like this. It will be centered around the ex-ante market valuation as of the beginning of the period plus direction of trade multiplied by the half spread plus the order costs. Well, plus or minus depending on the direction, of course. And now we can use the fact that we obtained in the last class, noting that effect of the adverse selection, effect of the new information is persistent, namely the new market valuation at the end of period T will be given by the initial market valuation, mu t minus 1, plus the spread part of the adverse selection. Or the adverse selection component of the spread. So to reiterate what we said last time around is that prices were semi-strong efficient, meaning that the transaction price equals the market valuation of the asset conditional on the trade. So once the trade has been fulfilled, the market valuation mu t is equal to the transaction price in the absence of order costs. While in the presence of order costs, you can see that this equality will be trivially violated. So. Our transaction price in period T will be given by the updated valuation mu T plus or minus the order costs. So the price will no longer be efficient, ex ante or exposed. Now let us look at how the dynamic impact of order costs differs, differs from that of adverse selection costs. As we have just seen, in the short run the deviation of price from the ex-ante market valuation is given by the realized spread. So by the adverse selection component of the spread S of dt plus the transaction order component gamma. So by short run here I mean deviation of prices offered, quoted in a given period, deviation of these quotes from the ex-ante market valuation. Let us now look at a long run wedge between prices and market valuation. In particular, let us calculate the expected future price, so expectation as of period T, at the end of period T, of some future price PT plus S, where S is some arbitrary amount of time. And let us compute the distance between this expected future price and the ex-ante 
market valuation mu t minus 1. Now, if we plug in the expression for prices that we have just computed, we will see that pt plus s is just given by this. It will be given by market valuation at the beginning of period t plus s plus the respective half spread, as again composed of both adverse selection and order processing components. The expectation of this value, however, is more or less close to just the ex-ante market valuation, mu t plus s minus 1. This is not a formal argument, hence the approximate equality. And if we only had adverse selection component with no order processing costs, then we would actually know for sure that this adverse selection component is zero on average. However, we do not know for sure whether the order processing costs are zero on average, which only happens if both buy and sell orders come in this future period with equal probabilities. However, we can assume that these come with approximately equal probabilities, which is generally pretty realistic, especially if we are talking about relatively distant future, t plus s. Hence, we will say that it is reasonable to say that this whole expectation is approximately equal to just expectation of the future market valuation. However, as we argued last time around, this expectation is just equal to our current market valuation mu t. Recall that this expectation is taken at the end of period t. So this comes once again from the fact that our best estimate for, of our future market valuation of the asset is given by our current market valuation of the asset. What this in the end gives us is that this long run impact of trade on prices is given by the adverse selection component of today's spread, meaning that adverse selection component, the information contained in the trade, will permanently shift the prices in the respective direction, with future trades then further uh, contributing more information and further shifting the prices, while at the same time the order processing costs will, no, will not shift the average prices in the long run. They only make the spread wider, but they do not have any long run effects. So to summarize, the order cost effect on prices is transient and is reversed by future trades, while the effect of adverse selection term is more permanent. Well, it is absolutely permanent in our model. Now it might help to see this visually. I have scribbled a um, short and simple graph that might help us see uh, how this all works. So in period one, our bid and ask quotes are centered around some market valuation mu zero. Mu zero is our market valuation of the asset at the beginning of period one. Now they have spreads A minus mu and mu minus b are composed of two components, the adverse selection component depicted here in green and the order processing costs depicted in blue. This applies to both sides of the market. Now suppose that we have a trader who wants to buy in period one. So they will trade at price A1 and what does it mean for the future prices? We see that market valuation at the end of period one, as a result of this trade, will be updated to mu one. So by observing a trader who wants to buy the asset, we infer that the market valuation 
might potentially be high or higher than mu0 or higher than a1 third times the charm however we see that this market valuation does not update all the way to a1 because only some part of this spread was due to adverse selection while this order processing cost component does not really give us anything does not tell us anything about mar uh, the actual market valuation about the actual fundamental value of the asset so in words that we just said the effect of adverse selection is permanent you see that if we continue I every trade shifts every future um, market valuation by its appropriate adverse selection component while order processing costs just widen the spread but do not have any long lasting impact on average prices now this was it for order processing costs pretty short and simple just because there is not much to talk about there so let us now move on to another factor that might drive the spread and this will be a little more interesting here we will be talking about uh, Stoll's model from 1978 and this model uh, argues that illiquidity or the bid ask spread may arise due to dealers asset inventory cost and the idea here is that dealers have to hold their inventory for some time so the whole purpose of dealers is to match buyers and sellers of the asset over time so today somebody wants to buy the asset, tomorrow somebody wants to sell the asset. And the goal of the dealer is to absorb this negative inventory for one period in which uh, there is a, an imbalance in supply and demand. However, this need to hold inventory, to hold inventory, is costly for the dealers because the price of the asset the value of the asset might change over time therefore if the dealers are actually risk averse they will require some premium for holding um, positive or negative positions in the asset at the outset this model might have, uh, might bear some slight resemblance to the Gloston Milgram model that we saw. In particular, we have uh, competitive market makers or dealers. But here, the fact that they are competitive will imply not just that they uh, will obtain zero profits in equilibrium, but we will use one other property of competitive markets, namely that these intermediaries act as price takers, and it will be an important part of our analysis. These dealers are risk averse, meaning that they have some optimal portfolio of risky assets and any deviation from this optimal portfolio must uh, be compensated with some premium. Risk aversion is a, uh, the main driving force of this model, since in the absence of risk aversion, namely if dealers were risk neutral, they would value all assets at their expected values and uh, we know that if prices are efficient which they are in for example lost and milgram market then market valuation is exactly equal to the expected value of any given asset so dealers who are risk neutral would be exactly indifferent between holding any kind of portfolio so long as prices are efficient they would have no inventory concerns Now what these market makers or dealers will do is they will submit their 
demand schedules or supply schedules. Oh, excuse that. Damn Steam. Yes, dealers will submit their competitive demand schedule. I am not doing another take with that. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> yes. So dealers will, uh, instead of offering just a single buy and sell quote, they will offer the whole supply schedules, which give uh, prices as functions of the amount traded. So this schedule will prescribe a separate price for any given amount that a trader might want to buy or sell. And you can see this schedule as a uh, limit order book filled exclusively by the dealer. Now we will still have noise traders who place market orders. The difference from Gloston Milgram model is that here we have no speculation, so we have no informed traders, and this is commonly known. So both noise traders and dealers agree uh, that there is no market participant who has any informational advantage over anyone else. You can ask, how does, in this case, information enter the market? Because the motivation that I gave you is that asset valuation might change over time and this is what drives the inventory risk. But if there, is, if there are no informed traders, then how does this market, uh, how does this information arrive to the market? And the answer that I can give you in that respect is uh, public announcements. So you can think that there are some uh, public news arriving overnight or during the trading process. These public announcements will shift valuation of all agents in the market, so both noise traders and dealers. And this is what drives the risk of the valuation changing. So we will not explicitly model noise traders, we will not model their um, order sizes, because this will not be really a relevant part of the model. In particular, we will purely focus on deriving this uh, supply and demand schedule by the dealers. Now, just a quick side note about risk aversion. While it is quite natural to assume that dealers are inherently risk averse, so they just do not like uh, taking risk and they would prefer safe positions. Uh, it might just as well be the case that dealers themselves are risk neutral, but risk aversion arises in the market instrumentally due to regulation. In particular, it might be the case that dealers are bound by some requirements to maintain some positions or to maintain a given margin so they cannot take they are prohibited from taking very large positions in any given asset if this is the case then as the dealers positions get close to these limits the dealers will make effort to push their inventory uh, down to zero in order to not hit these limits. And this kind of pressure would be exactly uh, the same as if dealers were risk averse. It gives them the exact same aversion to very large positions. So let us introduce the model in slightly more detail. We still have a single risky asset, which has current fundamental value mu t. And mu t here denotes, uh, again, market valuation given all the information that is ever revealed in period t. The difference, however, to Gloston Milgram model is that now no new information is revealed in period t. Therefore, mu t is the same as the um, is the market valuation at the beginning of the period as well as the as at the end of the period 
So this is a slight notation change from uh, from the Gloston Milgram model. I'm not a huge fan of that, but I am. Uh, I chose to follow the textbook in this respect. So we begin period T with some fundamental value mu T. Some trade occurs, some now non non single unit of the asset, but possibly arbitrary uh, trade size occurs in period T. Dealers then uh, buy or sell this amount and hold this position while the asset value changes overnight before the next period to some V. So in particular we will not even bother with introducing the full dynamic model. We will just say that uh, now you know what? Sorry, let me let me quickly change that. Here, done. Perfect quick cut. So let me start this again. We will say that uh, it dealers uh, the whole market begins the period with having fundamental value mu t. Then all trades happen in this period, and dealers have to hold on to the position that they acquired during this period. And they can only unwind these positions one period later, when the fundamental value has changed to mu t plus 1, which is given by mu t plus some innovation, plus some random shock to evaluation. Now note that this uh, model tries to go into a little bit of a resale area, so it tries to have this idea that dealers have to buy the asset today and then sell it later, or vice versa. But it does not go all the way. In particular, the dealers do not have to sell at the market price but rather they can unwind at the exact value mu t. So dealers do not suffer from future illiquidity. And this is not because they are the ones setting prices. Because um, first of all they are competitive so they cannot affect prices in this model. Or at least so the model goes. And second of all, they even though they can set prices, they still have to trade at the prices they set. I know this is a bit of tautology, but this is to say that they cannot expect to trade at exactly the mid quote. They will trade at the prices that they set. But they will probably want to also set prices that are different from UT plus one. So this is the simplifying assumption in the model. In order to eliminate all the dynamics from its solution process so that we can only focus on period t and ignore um, what happens after so just as a point of order this uh, shock to market value is assumed to be zero mean and is assumed to have some positive variance sigma square epsilon now as i said we are dealing with competitive dealers and we will be saying that there is just a single representative dealer who behaves competitively. But if you are more comfortable with that, you can uh, assume that there is a, a very large number of competitive dealers. It will not really... It will, of course, by de definition, by design, not change the argument, but uh, it might... Well, sorry might make you more comfortable with them with the argument so we will say that this representative dealer has some initial position in the asset some initial endowment in the asset and we will call this endowment zt so this is this uh, dealer's position at the beginning of period t and the dealer also has some initial cash ct Now note that these are not meant to represent any constraints. So the 
dealer can sell more than ZT units in period T and the dealer can buy any number of assets at a price larger than CT. So these are not meant to represent any constraints, these are just meant as a parameters of the model. Now, asset demand or supply by the dealer, as we said, is competitive. So the dealer acts as price taker. And given, price as, uh, given asset price PT, the dealer will decide how much units YT to supply to the, uh, to the market. And this supply or demand decision will be driven by the desire to maximize utility which we have not introduced yet. Utility, which is defined over the next period wealth, which is, a, of course, a random variable as perceived by the dealer at time t. So the dealer does not know what exactly his wealth will be, and this is where risk aversion will kick in. But the next period wealth, denoted by wt plus 1, will be given by, I forgot to change this, let me quickly change this to here, done. So at the beginning of the next period, the dealer's position in the asset will be ZT that he started with minus YT that he sold in period T. So this is however much the dealer will have left at the beginning of period T plus 1. So you can call this ZT plus 1. Every unit of the asset will be valued at mu T plus 1 as we have just argued. I guess we do not really need to explicitly assume that the dealer will uh, unwind all of his inventory at period T plus one, because if you really see this as a dynamic problem, then in each period, the dealer will have to decide how much to, how much to actually unwind at given prices. But in this model, we will assume that dealers are naive, that they are short-sighted, in the sense that they are not really fully calculating their future trading strategy. So they do not explicitly calculate that I will buy this amount today, I will then sell this half of this amount tomorrow and another half of this amount the day after. Instead, this model takes more a reduced form approach, which says that the dealer just values the asset at mu t plus one. So this is not a very sharp model. It's not up quite, it does not quite live up to modern economic standards, but it's from 1978, so we'll cut it some slack. Okay, so we have this part of the wealth which was dictated by uh, the dealer's future asset position. Then the dealer also owns some money. So the dealer had CT at the beginning of period T, and then the dealer bought or sold some asset, uh, some amount of the asset, and his revenue from doing so is PT times YT. So the dealer sold YT units at price PT. And here, of course, YT may, may be negative, just to be clear. So this amount in yellow is the agent's, is the dealer's cash holdings at the beginning of period T plus 1. So this is CT plus 1. And these two terms together give us the uh, a, a dealer's wealth at the beginning of period t plus 1. And utility is some function that is defined over this wealth. So now let me uh, just go once again a little slower over how we solve this model. Because it is not the most intuitive process. And this solution algorithm may appear slightly schizophrenic. So once again, we assume that dealers are competitive, which, once again, may be more reasonable if you think that there is a million dealers 
them uh, rather than one. So no single dealer can have a meaningful effect on prices. And they all act as price takers. They observe the demand and supply schedules set by all other dealers in the market and they optimize going from that. So the problem that any given dealer solves is that they decide how much of the unit to supply given any fixed price PT. But once again, they do not actually think that they can affect the price. Which is intuitive when you think about million dealers, but not intuitive when you think about a single dealer in the market. Because then obviously this is the one dealer who sets the price. So, for the dealer's maximization problem will yield us some supply function y of p and we will then with a representative dealer invert this function to obtain the equilibrium price schedule p of y which tells us what is the price that the dealer offers if you want to trade y units of the asset if you want to buy y units of the asset where y can be negative So let us try a few examples of this model. And here we will uh, consider two cases based on the preferences of the dealer, on the form of the risk aversion. We will begin with a case in which the dealer has mean variance preferences, meaning that utility from future wealth is given by the expectation of future wealth minus the variance of future wealth scaled by some coefficient rho, which measures risk aversion. Once again, the paper's age shows a little bit here, because uh, mean variance preferences do not have the expected utility structure. In more modern works, we would have some Bernoulli utility function which would uh, map the amount of money you have today into the units of happiness that you feel today. And your expected utility, your current utility function from your future wealth will be given by the expectation of those happiness units from your future wealth. Now this mean variance utility function does not have this structure Although it can be shown that uh, for some distributions of uh, Wt plus 1, in particular for some distributions of epsilon, our innovations to market valuation, this utility function is equivalent to the expected utility model with constant absolute risk aversion utility function, so exponential utility. But this was just a small side note. So let us plug in the expression for wealth, Wt plus 1, into this utility function. We will obtain that the expectation of future wealth is given by agent's future position in the asset. And the expected value of a unit of the asset is given by mu t because the expectation of mu t plus 1 is given by mu t. The agent's expectation of his future valuation for the asset is given by his current valuation for the asset. And monetary terms are fully determined in period t, so they fully survive uh, the expectation operator with no further changes. So this term gives us the expectation of future wealth, while the variance of future wealth will fully come from the asset holding, because as I just said, the value of cash is uh, cash is a riskless asset in this model, so its value is fully certain across periods. While the only variance comes from uncertainty of the future value of the asset, mu t plus one. So the variance of future wealth 
will be given by variance of epsilon scaled by the square root of the term by which it is multiplied. So the variance of wt plus 1 will be given by zt minus yt squared times the variance of epsilon. So this large expression is the dealer's utility function. And now let us use the algorithm that we've described in the previous slide to derive their supply schedule. Once again, the question is, given some fixed price p, how much, so what is the optimal y that the dealer is willing to supply to the market? So for fixed p, what is the yt that maximizes this expression? Taking the first order condition, meaning the first derivative of this uh, expression and setting it to zero, we will obtain the following asset supply function. So yt will be given by zt plus pt minus mu t normalized by the risk aversion terms. So risk aversion coefficient rho and the riskiness of the asset sigma squared epsilon. Now let us define the mid quote mt as the price at which the asset supply by the dealer is equal to zero. So mid quote is the price at which the dealer is not willing to supply any uh, unit of the asset or buy any unit of the asset. So it will be given by zero equal to zt plus mu t mi uh, mt minus mu t divided by rho times sigma squared t. Then if we express mt from this expression and then plug it into the, exp uh, the previous expression we had for the asset supply schedule, then we will obtain this expression. We will see that the asset supply by the dealer will be proportional to the difference between price and the mid quote or it will be linear in price. The more you want to buy from the dealer, the higher is the price you want to pay. And the less you want to buy, the less you want to pay. On a separate note, you can see that the mid quote MT will depend on the dealer's initial uh, asset position ZT. In particular, the higher is the dealer's initial position zt, the higher will be the mid quote mt. And uh, respect, respectively, the whole price schedule will also shift upwards. So the idea is the more, the larger is the position that the dealer currently has in the asset, the larger will be the price that the dealer will require to buy any further units of the asset. So the larger will be the risk premium. And vice versa, the larger will be the price at which the dealer is willing to sell the asset. Apologies, of course, I had it backwards. Let me try to say this again. The larger is the dealer's initial position in the asset ZT, the lower will be the mid quote MT. Because, because the dealer will be less eager to buy any further units of the asset and hence will offer lower price for those. And at the same time, the dealer will be very eager to sell the asset so he will offer lower prices at which the traders can buy the asset. Now, as you can see, um, as, and as we have already mentioned, the price will be linear in the traded quantity. Meaning that we can pretty much interpret this equation 
as the price impact equation. And if we do that, we will see that the price impact coefficient lambda will be equal to rho times sigma squared E, meaning that the larger is the, as the dealer's risk aversion, rho, the steeper is the price schedule. The faster is the, the price changes with the uh, traded quantity. And uh, the basically the less is the dealer's willingness to accept larger positions. The exact same thing happens with uh, sigma squared E. The more volatile is the asset valuation, the more risky the asset is. So once again, the dealer will be less excited about taking up larger positions and hence will require larger premium for uh, adopting these positions, which would mean steeper price schedule and larger price impact. So the more risk we expose the dealer to and the more, the more sensitive the dealer is to risk, the less is the market depth. And this last bullet point uh, emphasizes exactly that. Now let us look at another case, which is um, the case when the dealer has mean standard deviation preferences as opposed to mean variance preferences that we just saw. The model is not that much different. So now the utility from future wealth is given by the expectation of future wealth minus rho times the standard deviation of WT plus one. And standard deviation is of course just the square root of variance of WT plus one. If we once again uh, plug in the expression for WT plus one into this expression, we will obtain uh, this utility function in closed form as a function of yt and pt. Here, the expectation of wt plus one is just like we had it before. So it's mu t, the expected valuation of the asset times the dealer's future positions at t minus yt, plus the cash holdings, and minus rho times the standard deviation. The standard deviation is once again driven by, uh, purely by epsilon, by the innovation to market valuation. And given that standard deviation is a square root of variance, I don't think I even need to discuss it uh, in great detail. So the only trivial mathematical trap that you can fall into here is when you take square root of zt minus yt squared, you can just end up with zt minus yt, but recall that standard deviation is always a positive value. So you must have an absolute value here rather than, rather than simple um, brackets. This utility is peculiar in that it actually is linear in yt. Right? We have y, yt here, yt here, and yt here. And linear functions require a careful approach to maximization, especially on the unbounded domains like we have it here. So the question for, um, the question is, for a given price pt, what is the yt uh, that the dealer will be willing to supply to the market? Given that this utility function is linear in yt, the answer to that question will depend on the slope of this function with respect to yt. And if this slope is positive, then the dealer would be willing to set yt equal to plus infinity, meaning sell infinite amount of unit to the market. Vice versa, if the slope is negative, then the dealer would want to set yt to negative infinity, meaning to buy the infinite amount of units from the market. 
So the only real case in which we can have an equilibrium is if the slope of this function with respect to yt is exactly zero. Because in that case, the dealer would be exactly indifferent between buying or selling any amount of the asset. This condition gives us, um, well, not this. This is an attempt at using the first order approach, which will naturally fail in this case. But it will give us this. So the dealer will be indifferent between supplying any yt less than zt if the price will be at this level, so mu t minus rho times sigma t, sigma epsilon, and the dealer will be indifferent between supplying any yt above zt if the price is at this level. So you can see that here the price impact is actually zero. The price will not depend on the amount of the asset that is supplied to the market, but rather there will be a single point of discontinuity, which will be uh, determined by whether the dealer's position at the end of the period will be positive or negative. Now, this is in contrast to the previous version of the model that we considered with mean variance preferences. Because there, if you remember, and if you don't, I will show you, our supply schedule and price impact equation were linear in YT, so there were no discontinuities. In particular, if you interpret it literally, it will tell you that there is no bid-ask spread that is generated by this model. However, market depth will be linear. One way to extract bid-ask spread from this mean variance model would be to calculate the difference of prices uh, that the dealer quotes for yt equal to plus one unit or plus a hundred units or plus a thousand units, whatever your uh, standard order size is, and the negative of that amount. Since this price schedule is absolutely linear, this will give you some positive spread. But of course, this spread will be determined by exactly what is the order size that you will take. While in this uh, mean standard deviation preference version of the model, you will have a natural measure for the spread, which is the distance between these two prices, so the price at which the dealer is willing to accept a positive position and the price at which the dealer is willing to adopt a negative position in the asset, or long and short positions, respectively. However, these prices, uh, this discontinuity arises at the trade size yt equal to zt which can be arbitrarily positive or negative, depending, of course, on the dealer's initial position in the asset. But if uh, Zt is approximately zero, so if the dealer begins the period with all little or no inventory, then this uh, measure of two rho times sigma e would be quite natural as a measure of the PDESC spread. Yes, sorry for jumping around. So this is the stall model. In contrast to Gloston Milgram model, where the transaction price is always equal to the expected asset value given trade history, so we had price efficiency in the semi-strong sense. In the stall model, the price is uh, moved by incoming random noise trades and the mid price deviates from the expected value in a in magnitude that's proportional to the inventory z to the dealer's initial position so 
So the price in this model is no longer efficient. And the extra wedge between the market valuation and the price at which tra trades happen can be interpreted as the risk premium that the dealers require for uh, holding these positions of the asset. Now the question to you is, can, can you benefit from this as a trader, from this price inefficiency? Or in other words, can this price inefficiency lead to more favorable terms of trade to you as a trader? And the answer is yes. So if you are lucky enough to encounter a dealer who has a favorable position for, for you, for example, you want to buy the asset and the dealer has a very long position in the asset, meaning that they have a lot of stock in this asset, then this dealer would be willing to sell this asset to you relatively cheaply. In particular, cheaper than uh, the market valuation. However, if you are impatient and you are unlucky um, in the kind of dealer you encounter, then you might uh, suffer from this price inefficiency. So for example, if you, want, if you urgently need to buy some amount of the asset, but the only dealer in the market today uh, has a very, very short position, so they have already sold a lot more than they have bought today. In this case, the dealer will ask you for a very, very high price in case you want to buy the assets. So these terms of trade will be unfavorable to you. But once again, if you are lucky or if you are willing to wait until the dealer has an uh, inventory that's favorable for you, then in principle you could benefit from this as a trader. Now we have, uh, when we were talking about order costs earlier today, we have mentioned that the dynamic implications of the order costs and adverse selection differ. So they have the same impact in the short run but different impact in the long run. How does this work with our new factor, with the inventory cost? Obviously all three factors, so adverse selection, order costs, and inventory risk, have the exact same implications in the short run. They all lead quotes to deviate from the current market valuation of the asset. However, the, what are the long run implications? We already saw that adverse selection affects prices permanently, while the effect of trading fees dies out very rapidly. Now, the effect of inventory risk is somewhere in between. Namely, you can assume that uh, the dealers try to hold neutral balance, neutral position in the asset in the medium to long run. So they try to converge back to this neutral position, but they are not uh, very tight on that rule. So they are not bound to have neutral position at any given point in time. Meaning that at any given point in time they may have non-zero inventory which will cause the prices to deviate from uh, the market valuation and any trade will have will, uh, will change dealers inventory so will have some impact on prices in the nearest future that it takes the dealer to unwind these positions but in the medium to long run the dealers will get rid of this inventory and so the prices will converge back to the efficient level so you can say that the effect of inventory risk on prices is a medium run. This graph might help you summarize uh, all that we've 
just said in a visual way. So here we begin with some market valuation as of the beginning of the period. And then suppose that all three factors come into play for a traded period T. So we have some adverse selection component, we have some inventory risk component, and we have the order processing cost component. Now, as we argued, the adverse selection component is permanent. So the very, very long run prices will be different in expectation from today's ex ante market valuation by exactly the adverse selection component. On the other hand, the order processing cost component is negated immediately. So it only affects today's prices, but it has no effect on the expected trade price uh, from tomorrow onwards or from the next order onwards. So the inventory control cost component does have some lasting effect, but it will gradually die down. So it has some medium run effect on prices. We will use this distinction in the dynamic effects in uh, different factors affecting the spread in, I believe, next class, when we will be talking about the estimation of the contribu contributors of the spread. So next week we will be talking about um, how these three factors contribute empirically to the spread. And in the meanwhile, today, we have uh, talked about two of these new factors, and we have discussed that the spread is not only driven by adverse selection, but rather order costs and inventory risk might have an effect as well. And all these three factors have different dynamic effects. And next week, or in next class, we will leverage this distinction to estimate the importance of each mechanism and the empirical contribution of each mechanism. Now the reading list for the class for this lecture contains some readings that are approximately relevant to this class, in particular to the inventory risk. And uh, chapter three in the textbook has some relevant exercises, again, mostly on the inventory risk simply because order processing costs are such a trivial uh, thing from the point of view of economics. Thank you for sticking around, and I will see you for next class.